Okay, so we are recording now. Um, first of all, thank you for, for joining us um, for this first episode of the Face of the Month series, uh, which is being run by the Centre for Law, Social, Social Legal Studies uh, within the um, School of Law and Policing at the University of Central Lancashire. It is a pleasure to be able to um, introduce uh, the guest today, who is Mr. John Finnehan. I hope that's the right pronunciation. Um, um, there is Kinnahan. There is no F in my name and in my surname. <laughs> Kinnahan, yes. Um, mm. So, uh, Mr. Kinnahan has, has kindly filled in for Dr. Susan Kerr, who, who was not able to join us today. Um, but Mr. Kinnahan has been working for Forum 18. Um, for how many years now, Mr. Kinnahan, have you been working for them? Oh, it's over 20 years. For over so. 20 years. So, um, Forum 18 is a human rights organisation, essentially, that um, produces uh, analysis and, and, and monitoring, really, of, of violations of uh, thought, conscience, religion and belief, with a particular focus in um, Central Asia, Russia, uh, Russian-occupied Ukraine, Belarus and the South Caucasus area. Um, so that's the area that we're going to be focusing on today because of course the um, focus for today is for this session is um, threats to uh, freedom of religion or belief uh, in 2024. So we're kind of looking at what is currently uh, happening in the area of, of religious freedom and violations taking place, but then also um, trying to do a little bit of forecasting as well to what could be expected um, in this year uh, when it comes to um, violations of religious freedom, but also maybe even progress made in certain areas as well. Uh, but I'll let Mr. Kinnahan provide us with, with more details on that and some of the work that he does. Um, so I suppose I should start off today with, with asking Mr. Kinnahan, what, what are the most concerning threats um, for religious freedom uh, from your perspective and, and <laughs> what are the countries w that you'd like to focus on specifically today? Okay. Well, I mean, it, we don't have time to go through all of them, but <laughs> what I think might be good is if I gave, as I said yesterday, a roughly 20 minute chat snapshot illustrating, you know, sort of some typical freedom of belief violations we've documented in Kazakhstan, Russia and Russian occupied Ukraine, but without looking at all types of violations we've noted or territories we monitor. Um, I think that would probably be um, you know, sort of no thing. Of course, we can't predict what might happen, um, but um, the trends, as you will see as I speak, are not good. Mm, yes. So would that be helpful? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Uh, which country would you like to focus on first or which area would you think? Uh, well, as I said, um, I would say I need to look at some typical FORB or pre-commission relief violations in Kazakhstan, Russia and Russian occupied Ukraine. Of course, geographically, you know, that gives us a reasonable spread in terms of the, you know, the countries that we look at. Yes. So if we start with uh, Kazakhstan, then what are what is taking place there at the moment in terms of uh, restrictions on on religion? And well, well, as I say, well, as I say, it's I mean, we can't really document that, but I, I do think it will be helpful if I just gave a full 20 minute snapshot and then we then we, as I said yesterday, and then and then, you know, move into Q&A. And that's what I'm saying. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yes, that'd be great. Thank okay. you. So, as I say, I'll be aiming to give a roughly 20 minute snap, snap short on this. Um, before I begin, um, it's worthwhile noting that understandings of what FORB, freedom original belief, is can be confused. So, it's worthwhile to note two important points about what this freedom is. Please forgive me if I'm attempting to teach people what they already know. So FORB is a freedom for all people, and it's a mistaken to only consider FORB violations against single groups only, for example, Christians. Similarly, limiting our focus to minorities can lead to accidentally ignoring groups we had not thought of. 
And what of those who self-identify as part of majorities, but may differ from others in following their beliefs outside state control, or in wanting full equality for LGBTI people? As former UN Special Rapporteur on for Basma Jahangir, a Pakistani lawyer who defended Christians accused of blasphemy, commented, when I'm asked which community is persecuted most, I always reply, human beings. There's also an extremely good practical reason for seeing for, like indeed all human rights, as a right for all. Seeking to protect some from persecution necessarily involves seeking to protect all from persecution. Um, um, upholding full enjoyment of free traditional belief would enhance its enjoyment by all, whether believer, non-believer or ambivalent, as the former special, new and special rapporteur on for Bahman Chahid, current special rapporteur on for Nazida Ghane, and a well-known international academic expert on for Professor Sir Malcolm Evans wrote in 2019. Now, it's also worthwhile avoiding assuming that a perpetrator's or a target's beliefs are the motivation for four violations. They may be, of course, but other factors may be at work. Former UN Special Rapporteur and Forb Heine Bielefeld has written that Forb is linked to other freedoms, including freedom of expression and freedom of peaceful assembly and association. There can be no free religious community life without respect for those other freedoms, which are closely intertwined with the right to freedom of original belief itself. This is exactly what worries authoritarian governments and often causes them to curb freedom of original belief. Similarly, where there are serious human rights violations, such as, for example, of the right to have free and fair elections, there are also high levels of corruption. So why does Form 18 do, does what it does? Do no better, I think, than to quote an alleged quote of Sherlock Holmes, who is said to have told Dr. Watson, it is a capital mistake to theorise before you have all the evidence. It biases the judgment. Now, Holmes might well have, uh, have been speaking about responding to any human rights violation as evidence-based, truthful, original, detailed and accurate monitoring analysis of all violations is the essential first step for formulating, implementing and evaluating any realistic policies and activities seeking to end violations of four and interlinked human rights, as both the EU guidelines on the promotion and protection of original belief and the British FCDO's Freedom of Original Belief Toolkit state. Now, the dictatorships in the territory's Forum 18 monitors are hostile to documenting reality. They target anyone they see as actually or potentially outside their control, often claiming security, extremism or terrorism to justify violating Forb and other freedoms. So it's vital to ask what exactly regime claims mean in concrete reality. For as human rights defender Václav Havel commented, because the regime is captive to its own lies, it must falsify everything. Going on to observe that it is a world of appearances trying to pass for reality. Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, for example, host meetings for foreign religious leaders which make extravagant claims of religious tolerance, state-controlled religious dialogue. Such meetings and their foreign guests promote state propaganda and never seriously address the host's serious Forb and linked human rights violations. Well, this is dangerous, for it tells regimes that human rights, the rule of law and freedom are of no importance. For example, Kazakhstan's commitment to tolerance and dialogue may be judged by, among many other things, the unelected President Tokayev's order in January 2022 to shoot to kill protesters without warning. Without any evidence, Tokayev called the protesters terrorists, although the evidence pro points to the protests being triggered by the Kazakh people's deep frustration at the inequality, human rights violations and corruption the unelected regime is based upon. The regime itself has admitted to at least 238 people being killed. Um, the Kazakhstan International Bureau for Human Rights and the Rule of Law, a very well respected human rights organization, found that the dead included random passers by, 
children and peaceful protesters. Around 10,000 people were detained and a KRBHR survey found that 71% of those surveyed, surveyed were tortured. Torture victims including children, persons with disabilities, civil activists and foreign nationals. As the protests broke out, changes to the religion law came into force, which widened state religious censorship and make holding religious meetings away from state registered places of worship more difficult. Officials repeatedly refused to explain to Forum 18 why they were introduced. The latest restrictions are part of a wider context of increasing restrictions on all human rights. In Kazakhstan, all exercise of form without state permission, including sharing beliefs, is illegal. And even communities that have state permission to exist also need state permission for where they hold their weekly meetings for worship. In 2022, well, we're still working on the 2023 figures, there are over 140 known prosecutions for hosting worship meetings, sharing or selling religious literature and items, you know, instead of sharing or teaching faith, posting religious material online, or praying in mosques in ways that the state controlled Muslim bans, for example, using the word Amen. Two Muslims from the ethnic Dungan minority in the south of the country, who taught the Quran and Islam to local, to, to local children, were among the six individuals known to be punished in 2022 for teaching their faith without state permission. Now this brings to 13 the number of ethnic Dunga Ans from, uh, who've been punished for teaching children to read the Quran without state permission since August 2018, an unusually high geographic constant concentration. Yet the head of Kordai District Police, Maxed Erezhepov, denied to Forum 18 that there was any ethnic factor, as he put it, in the, the prosecutions. The regime also jails Muslims for following and discussing Islam outside state controlled structures. In the most recent known jailing on 20th of June 2022, Anatoly Zernichenko was jailed for seven years for posting on media and social media Muslim texts which prosecutors without any evidence claimed promoted terrorism. The judge allowed no, allowed no questioning of the regime's experts and the investigators and the prosecutors refused to discuss his case with Forum 18. His wife, Anna Tukova, told Forum 18, we want to achieve justice. They fabricated the case against him for nothing. Many of the Muslim prisoners of Constance jail for exercising their job have been tortured. In one example, prisoner of conscience Dadash Majenov was tortured in 2019 for marking Eid al-Fitr and praying the namaz. An official insisted to Forum 18 that he hit his head on a wall. And the Labour camp head insisted to Forum 18 that there aren't any tortures here. In January 2022, camp officials broke Majenov's law by beating jaw by beating him with truncheons. The Labour camp head refused to answer Forum 18's questions, claiming that it didn't happen before putting the phone down. In June 2023, prisoner of conscience Majenov was denied a transfer to a Labour camp near at his home or to early release, apparently to punish him for wearing shorts and praying while standing up after lights out. <clears throat> In September 2021, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention called for nine Muslims jailed for participating in an online religious discussion group, group to be immediately freed and compensated for their imprisonment. Yet even now, they've still not been freed. The General Prosecutor's Office, the Religious Affairs Committee, the Foreign Ministry and the government controlled the National Human Rights September, all in September 2023, two years after the after the working group on arbitrary detention's finding refused to explain to Forum 18 why they hadn't been freed. The regime's hostility to human rights was again demonstrated last month by the National Security Secret Police warning people not to discuss a draft amending law 
seen by Forum 18, amending nine codes and laws, imposing yet more restrictions on exercising FORB. NSC secret police head Jovek Sagenberg told deputies of the non-freely elected parliament, the initiative on the need to harshen legislation in the area of regulating religious activity has more than once been discussed at a government level. Now, the regime has allowed no public discussion of any of these proposed amendments or other laws relating to the exercise of FORB. Kazakh legal expert, who wishes to be anonymous for fear of state reprisals, told Forum 18 last month that the proposed amendments raise many questions and concerns. In Russia, for Russia's renewed 2022 invasion of Ukraine, the most serious fault violations within its internationally recognized boundaries were criminal prosecutions and jailings of Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims who meet together, both of which groups are associated with banned allegedly extremist organizations. Now, the activities being prosecuted are similar, including meeting in each other's homes to pray and sing together, to study sacred texts, and to discuss shared beliefs. Typically, the first those targeted know of a case against them is early morning raids on their home by large numbers of armed FSB secret service officers, Omon riot police, and possibly officers of, of other Russian ag agencies, including one instance, the investigative department of the Russian Navy's Northern Fleet. Officials search homes, inspecting and seizing any religious literature, electronic devices and money before taking some people away from interrogation. Almost everyone in investigated is, even if no trial happens, put on the Rosfin monitoring list of terrorists and extremists, which blocks their bank accounts and causes problems in finding formal employment, obtaining insurance, buying, selling, renting property and a range of other financial activities. In 2022, there were 124 convictions of Jehovah's Witnesses. 48 Jehovah's Witnesses were jailed for up to eight years. After a Moscow court in June 2023 handed prison terms of up to six and a half years to six Muslims who met to study the, their faith using the works of Turkish theologian Said Nursi, the same court is right now hearing the case of two more. 45 year old Jurab Jabrilev and 53-year-old Jekun Rostamov have been held since August 2023. Yet investigative committee and FSB security service documents seen by Forum 18 revealed that the investigation, which has involved covert surveillance, has been ongoing since 2017. <clears throat> After the renewed 2022 invasion of Ukraine, new legal offenses were brought in for protesting against the war with a range of punishments up to 10 year jail terms. Many Russian religious <clears throat> leaders, most prominently the Moscow Patriarchate hierarchy, support the renewed invasion. In some cases, this is due to warnings to senior and local religious leaders and prosecuting and fining religious believers and clergy who have opposed the war. It's unclear what effect this may have had on those who considered protesting against the war. And of course, similar tactics have been used against many Russians who oppose the war for any reason. Among the thousands of Russians who've been detained and taken to court for protesting against the war, a small number have done so from a religious perspective or using explicitly religious <laughs> imagery. To take one current case, investigators are working on a criminal case against independent Orthodox Archbishop Viktor Kovoyev for repeat discreditation of the armed forces. If convicted, he could be prisoned for five years. Archbishop Victor, who turned 87 this month, has repeatedly condemned the invasion of Ukraine and the conduct of the war as, quotes, aggressive, satanic, and cursed both by God and people in sermons and articles. His first conviction was in March 2023, when he was fined one month's average local wage or more than two months average local pension for anti-war comments in a sermon. Investigators are now accusing him again of quote unquote discrediting the armed forces. Armed personnel, apparently from the National Guard, although they did not identify themselves, raided Archbishop Victor's church in early October 2023. They beat, 
tortured and detained his assistant, Harman Yugon Segida, who was later briefly jailed for allegedly disobeying a police officer. The Federal Investigative Committee in Krasnodar region branches of the Interior Ministry and the Federal Security Service did not answer Forum 18's questions on the case. Uh, the community is very intimidated with parishioners afraid to attend services, one parishioner told Forum 18, and everyone who does attend services is openly filmed by officials. In Russian occupied areas of Ukraine, there are, of course, also four and other human rights violations. On 23rd November, armed and masked officials raided Alushta's independent Yuka Ari Jami mosque, seizing two Islamic books. Early that morning, they also raided the home of the Imam, Yusuf Ashirov, another mosque, and two other mosque community leaders. The three men were jailed, then jailed for between two and five days. On Friday the 24th of November, while Imam Mashirov was in prison, officials of the Centre for Countering Extremism came to Yukari Jami Mosque to support an Imam appointed by the Crimean Muslim Board, a state-controlled entity to which the mosque does not belong. They conducted Friday prayers at gunpoint, threatening that if any of the people stood up and began to give the sermon, they would simply take them away from there, a lawyer told oh, maybe. Early on 30th November, about, about six masked officers raided the home of Adjub Gafarov, the chair of Ukari Jami Mosque community. Only one of them identified himself, Lieutenant Colonel Ruslan Shambarov, who is head of the police's centre for countering extremism in Crimea. Shambarov told Gafarov that as head of the mosque community, he had to get the community to accept the new own arm imposed by the Crimean mosque Muslim board and keep the community a calm. Now, Forum 18 was unable to find out from Lieutenant Colonel Shambazov why he seized it as his role to interfere in the affiliation of a religious community and who it chooses as its leader. Among other cases in Russian occupied Ukraine, just over two weeks ago, on 13th of February, Unknown men from the Russian occupation forces seized 59-year-old Father Stefan Podolchok of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine in the Russian-occupied part of Kherson region. They took him away barefoot with a bag over his head, insisting that he needed to come for questioning. Two days later, on 15th of November, or February rather, his bruised body, possibly with a bullet wound to the head, was found on the street in his village and taken to the morgue. Maud staff phoned his wife to identify the body, which showed signs of bruising and traces of having been in handcuffs. The death certificate issued to the family claimed that Father Stepan had died of a heart attack. Father Stepan's family buried him in Kalanchak on Sunday the 18th of February. When Forum 18 on 19th February asked Kalanchak's Russian police what action they have taken or will take following the killing of Father Stepchen the duty officer, who would not give his name, replied, For a long time this community hasn't existed here and won't. Forget about it. He then put the phone down. In no territory, that Forum 18 monitors, is it possible to present a complete picture of all the freedom of religion and belief or other human rights violations that happen, as people in religious communities have an entirely reasonable and well-justified fear of state reprisals if they discuss their experiences. That is in itself a strong indication of the seriousness of the situation. The International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, the bedrock of human rights protection worldwide, states that Recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world, and that these rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. Current events remind us of these truths rather forcibly, working out in concrete terms what practically can and should be done to defend the dignity of a human person is not easy. But this is the challenge and the opportunity which Forb lays before us. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to our discussion.
Thank you, Mr. Kinnahan. That was really interesting in terms of just the, the, the case studies and the information very in depth um, and hopefully as well um, after today, if you could maybe provide us with links to Forum 18 for, for those who are who are listening, that would also be be fantastic as well. Um, That's easy. I can put that in the in the in the, in, in, in the chat chat right now. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, that it would be good to get those direct links to the website. Um, so as you were talking, I was thinking about some questions myself. We do have one in also in the in the chat there from Mark, um, but I'll just start off with 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 my one because it it was um, it was about something you said right at the start, which was that states are using various different narratives to restrict or justify their restrictions of religion. So in your view and on the basis of that, do you think we need clearer margins of appreciation for states in terms of their use of these narratives? Because some of them could be interpreted as justified in the sense that, you know, preserving security states might have a reasonable um, you know, need to do that, obviously, or com combating terrorism. It's like, it, the narratives often sound good on the surface, but of course we know that they are misused. So do we need clearer margins to, to, um, to, to more precisely define uh, how states you know, should be using these, these narratives and in what instances would constitute a misuse of these kinds of narratives? Well, I mean, you know, stuff, it's, that's on one level fairly easy to answer. First, of course, the narrative of extremism has no purchase whatsoever in international law. We you know it's doing something, um, you know, as the former UN Special Rapporteur for Protecting Human Rights While Countering Terrorism observed after a country visit to Kazakhstan. Um, so far as margin appreciation goes, actually, what we need is greater implementation of states' obligations in terms of original belief. And one needs to get at what exactly is being prosecuted, who has been raided for what reasons. Um, margin of appreciation, as you probably know, is the European Court of Human Rights, and it refers to the leeway allowed to states, you know, to, to you know, implement the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, actually, but there is no leeway, you know, to for, for example, torture. It's absolutely prohibited along with slavery. Yeah. Um, in terms of security, then in international law, then security is not a permissible reason to limit the freedom of religion or belief. You know, so that there is no margin there whatsoever. Um, now, it's important to remember that all human rights are interlinked, indivisible, universal. They work together. There are different permissible limitations around under each human right. Okay. Um, and, you know, so, you know, it's possible, of course, to take action to on grounds of security to limit, for example, freedom of expression or something but not to limit free traditional belief. Now here, one point to make also is that as all human rights are interlinked, then for the great majority of human rights, it's impossible to think of a rights violation of one right that doesn't include a violation of other rights. Free traditional belief is one such example. I myself have never come across a form of violation which doesn't also invite the action of other rights. Um, so in terms of clearer definitions, I would say not so much definitions as greater understandings um, and insisting that, you know, human rights obligations that states have voluntarily taken on are to be observed. Yes, yes, of course. And thank you for that answering that. Yes, very interesting. Um, 
We'll just come to Mark's question now, which um, for those who, who can't see the chat, um, in, the <laughs> uh, yes, in the absence of authoritarian regimes in the UK and Western Europe, do you have concerns that emerging right wing movements through their online platforms can lead to the suppression of freedoms and belief, freedom of beliefs through subversive activities? by non-state actors? Well, I mean, first, of course, I should know that I live in this state, but Forum 18 doesn't want to monitor those states. So um, I, will do, I will defer for a more detailed answer to those who study rather more thoroughly. Um, but um, when one sees, for example, you know, actors around the UK government, you know, wanting the UK to leave the European Convention on Human Rights, which one should remember was drafted in the main by British lawyers who often have political associations to the Conservative Party. You'd never imagine that these days, or something. Um, then yes, it is concerning. Um, similarly, in terms of state, non-state actors, it's possible for anyone to undermine human rights. And all I would say is in that to answer the specific point about online platforms. If we normalize a discourse, um, I mean, if we normalize a discourse that attacks other people, that makes the undermining of human rights become part from something that as we've seen most recently in terms of engages in racist <laughs> discussion, then of course we change the climate and we change it in bad ways. Yes, of course, yes. Um, I've just got another question here from from Ian Turner. Um, thank you, Ian, for, for this question. So um, how does John see the difference between free speech and freedom of thought and conscience, if at all? Um, he may have answered this question already since he referred to the interrelationship of rights or the indivisibility of rights, but he just wondered if you wanted to add any further on on the differences between free speech and freedom of thought and conscience as rights? Well, I mean, it depends upon what exact action one is talking about here and something. Um, but um, it's worthwhile observing that um, freedom of original belief is a right that, you know, can be exercised alone or in community and others. So it's both an individual and a collective right. And it embraces a very wide range of activities to do with the expression of original beliefs. It should be noted here that the reason why you have the phrase original or belief um, is because religion refers to those that are beliefs that would self-identify as religious. Beliefs yeah. includes deeply held ethical perspectives, ethical beliefs, for example, those held by humanists. So, so you don't need to be quote unquote religious to yeah. you know, the freedom of original belief. All human rights have all rights. Um, in one key difference in terms of permissible limitations, as I said, is that in terms of freedom of expression can be limited on grounds of national security, freedom of original belief can't be. Um, the reason is fairly simple. It's because nobody wants to make espionage a human right. Um, so that's a, that's a but, pretty short objective answer. No, thank you for that. Yeah. And also, I just wanted to ask as well around this topic of cult activity, because this is something that I often get asked when I'm talking about religious freedom and the whether there are exceptions or margins of appreciation around the the, the idea of um, religious groups, perhaps not respecting the rights of their own members. Um, what in terms of such as, and what, what kind of thing do you have in mind? And it's perhaps of denying them freedom of movement or denying them the um, the ability to leave the group freely. Um, um, so that what, there are what, things around can that. You a, can you give me an example of a religious group denying freedom of movement? I know well, what I'm addressing here. This may not refer to in, in the area that, that you study specifically that region, but um, certainly the Church of Scientology has been accused of um, 
keeping its members in buildings right. against their will. Right. Or well, well. even the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, um, encouraging the family members of those who've left to kind of disconnect from them or or disaffiliate uh, from them. Right. And okay. Kind of from the religious group to do that. Okay. Well, I mean, of course, it, I mean, if you keep somebody against their will, saying that's unlawful imprisonment. Yes. So, you know, the, you know, no, no human right will defend that one. <laughs> Thank um, so far um, as, you know, sort of Jehovah's Witness practices of shunning, for example, goes, um, then courts have tended to fight shy of actually bringing that at out. A, because, you know, anybody can choose to leave a group, whatever the group might happen to be, whether JW or Jehovah's Witnesses or not. Um, B, because that doesn't necessarily affect, you know, sort of the, you know, freedom of others to carry on associating with those individuals for the individuals to form new friendships, new communities to express beliefs they may have in other ways. Um, I don't know whether that answers that comment or not. Agree. Can I just add an extra question on to of that? Of course. Um, just to, again, <laughs> regarding this word cult, because it just comes up so often and it's it's very highly misused and, and politicised, I think, um, especially against new religious groups and, and minorities even. Um, do you think that there is any room in terms of international law being able to um, define this word better or, or to try to, I don't know, bring up some characteristics, clearer characteristics of, of what cults are, because it seems to be that states might use this word, uh, weaponize it essentially against groups that they simply disapprove of or find unfamiliar or strange perhaps. So is there any, what can recourse can be taken at the international level on the use of this word cult? Well, I mean, People can use whatever words they please, and the cult is well. Cult isn't really recognised. I mean, I think the best response is, you know, to quote from paragraph two of gen, of General Comment Twenty Two, which is the UN Human Rights Committee's authoritative comment on the interpretation of Article Eighteen, freedom of thought, conscience, and and, and belief of the International Covenant and civil and political rights. And the Human Rights Committee notes, and I quote. Article 18 protects theistic, non-theistic and atheistic beliefs, as well as the right not to profess any religion or belief. The terms belief and religion are to be broadly construed. Article 18 is not limited in its application to traditional religions or to religions and beliefs with institutional characteristics or practice analogous to those of traditional religion. The, the committee therefore views with concern any tendency to discriminate against any religion or belief for any reason, including the fact that they are newly established or represent religious minorities that may be su subject to hostility on the part of a predominant religious community. And so, I mean, frankly, in international law, the protection is already there. Yes, but then we still see state using this this word cult don't it? it's, it's one of these maybe narratives isn't it alongside extremism security um it, it seems to be just another one of those of those narratives that it, you know to to try to perhaps um make society fearful of a group um that it's somehow dangerous or i'm, I'm, I'm indeed I'm, i mean i mean with the jehovah's witnesses it's tried to 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 say that this the, the jehovah's witnesses are somehow dangerous to society and then justifies their restriction and of course the the violations that you've you mentioned today yeah <clears throat> i mean kazakhstan maintains you know state-funded to called anti-sect centers and something um, whose function is fairly obvious to encourage violations of FORB. Um, I mean, it's always worthwhile when, you know, one hears such speech is to 
drill down and to go back to say, so what exactly is being objected to here? What precise actions of meetings? Are we objecting just to people meeting together to discuss different beliefs or what? Um, you know, I think it, it's, you know, because the function of such language is also very much to obscure, you know, sort of, you know, rather than to get to, okay, what's the detail? What is actually being attacked here? Um, so that would be one suggestion that I'd have. It's certainly something that, you know, you know, people would use in relation to, you know, the states that we look at um, who will use extremism and terrorism quite a lot. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So it's this idea that if you or this approach that if you, you know, dig down beneath the surface that soon enough you will come to, um, you know, discrimination on the basis of, you know, essentially belief or practice, because that seems to be the underlying um, issue, isn't it? Under these narratives that are being used, uh, well, the the. I they are discriminating on the basis of of religion or belief um actually no i mean in the and certainly in the territories that form 18 looks at um the real issue is state control mm. what states are worried about is people doing anything independent of the state including of course engaging you know exercising their freedom of religion or belief or forming opposition political parties or whatever and sort of thing you know as as it right at the start, it is worthwhile asking, questioning what the motivation may be. It may have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the, the with the ideas, the beliefs, and everything to do with certainly in the case of territories form eighteen looks at the fact that people are engaging in exercising their human rights in ways that are independent of state control. And that's what seems to motivate states rather than yeah. the content of beliefs. Right, that's interesting. Have you um, also found that um, the majority religion or the religion that you could say is privileged by the state, so I'm thinking the Russian Orthodox Church here in Russia, um, are they complicit in some ways in, 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 in encouraging these kinds of restrictions? Oh, yes. I yeah. mean, the, the hierarchy of the Russian Orthodox mm -hmm. Church, you know, sort of is deeply complicit in this. Yes. There, a distinction should be made um, between the hierarchy and others. There are many, you know, sort of Russian Orthodox who um, have, you know, sort of protested against the war, have been jailed, um, have protested against the actions of their bishops. Thing. Um, one, Yes, and he was prosecuted, he's now in exile, um, predicted to us that there's probably going to be quite a shake-up in Russian Orthodoxy after, you know, the, after the war, um, after Putin goes, and he will go because he's not eternal and something. Um, you know, because so many people are, um, you know, you know, are very, very unhappy about the behaviour of the hierarchy of the Russian church and remember the the penalties for protesting against the war can be severe so for every person who publicly protests then you can be pretty sure there'll be a lot of people who don't publicly protest but who share their views right yeah so in a in a way um the the whatever the privileged religion might be is become highly politicized because it well, has to, because in a way to survive would you say the, the um, hierarchy no. has to do that to has to maintain its links to the kremlin for example in this case to to survive because if if they came out and said against putin then they would just be replaced <clears throat> Well, um, you know, to say to survive, well, all I'd say is that those Russian Orthodox um, who've protested against Putin and the war clearly don't share the view that Russian Orthodoxy to survive needs to stay close to Putin. Right, interesting. Yes. Um, thank you for that. Um, I just want to read out what, what Ian Turner again has, has said, interestingly, in the, in the chat here. Um, so he said that he has a particular interest in the community of rights, which is sometimes incompatible with individualism. Rousseau talked about a civic religion, um, for example, social cohesion. Um, 
The issue is what to do with those who don't conform to the civic religion. Um, so not necessarily a question there, but just an interesting comment from, from Ian. Um, in terms of just to finish up, because I know we're coming to the end uh, now and um, we have gone over time as well. Um, just to finish up, so um, in terms of your future work with with Forum 18 this year, what are you um, going to be focusing on? Is it is it going to be what's taking place in Ukraine? What are you most concerned about? We are led by the rights violations that happen by progressive laws. Mm -hmm. um, it's not possible to predict in advance what those violations will be. Yes. Um, so that's your answer, <laughs> basically. We'll be, we'll be led by you know, what the repressive governments do, because our role is to monitor and analyse the violations of the freedom of original belief in those particular territories. Thank you very much. Well, it's been really interesting to speak to you, Mr. Kanahan, and um, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this as well and enjoyed um, answering some of the questions that we had. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to know more, then do take a good website. Send this www.formmeeting.org. And you. Um, you can see us on Facebook, Twitter, you know, Telegram, and so forth. Thank you. And thank you That's for the as well as sign up email for bulletins. Thank you. Yes. Um, I will send out an email as well to people um, with this with the video link um, when thank it's you. all um, right. Yes. Thank How many people were actually present? Was I was uh, only picking up three or four. Well, yeah, there was there was about three or four in live. Um, we did have seven who had registered, or actually nine okay. who had registered. So I'm going to send them the um, the the video, uh, so then they don't miss out on it. Okay. Uh, and right. It will be shared in different places as long as you're happy with that um, okay. on your clan website, etc. Um, and um, but anyway, thank you so much for, okay. for being first. Uh, first person to be part of this series and um, thank you this time and i'm sorry that, uh, that um susan kerr you know wasn't able to you know be part of it herself no but hopefully sometime in the future but you've been an excellent guest so thank yeah. you so much john yeah. thank you uh, thank you to everyone else as well and we look forward to the next episode of uh face of the month for the center for social legal studies thank you everyone thanks very much Okay, bye.